Hello, and welcome to this week's Movie Math, the last quiet weekend at the box office for quite some time. In fact, our next quiet weekend isn't until April 28th. Oh boy, that is a very nice chunk of busy time for us, because it has been quiet. Uh, and the reason that that's a quiet weekend, April 28th, is because that's uh, that's right before the summer movie season starts, at the beginning of May, with Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Uh, and also, this summer's release schedule is jam-packed as well. It's getting to be like before the pandemic again. Uh, as for this weekend, it was quiet because Quantumania is this coming weekend. Do you see a pattern here? Giving Marvel movies a wide berth? Interesting. And then, of course, the Super Bowl. And because we like ourselves some charts, let's take a look at Super Bowl charts. We have one for all the commercials. This one came out of Variety, and they're basing it off of YouTube views the day of the game. And look who's number one, Melissa frickin' McCarthy. I can't believe it for her Booking.com commercial. Apparently still worth every penny. That blows my mind. Uh, yesterday was actually a pretty big day for The Little Mermaid, even though Disney pulled the trailer at the last minute, devastating so many of you. And Halle Bailey herself trended number one right before the game started. And in fact, when the game kicked off, she was still giving it a run for its money due to, let's say, personal drama. That seemed to be the case. And some of you even believe when I, um, you know, she could, I'd heard it Saturday morning that they were moving the trailer, but I was, I, I didn't want to, you know, expose my sources, so I had to give it a little bit of a, a window. But then when Halle Bailey, you know, told a fan on social media that it wasn't dropping, I was able to confirm. Uh, and when I did, a lot of you, in addition to being devastated, were like, is this because of Hallie's personal drama? And a lot of you were uh, blaming her boyfriend, or as, or as many of you feel, who should be her ex-boyfriend. So that, that's, that's very, very interesting. Uh, that's, that's certainly not something one would have on their Little Mermaid bingo card, but that's where we find ourselves. But hey, chatter's chatter. And so Melissa McCarthy and Hallie Bailey did incredibly well yesterday. Uh, now, as to what I heard about the Little Mermaid trailer, as I tweeted, I heard it might drop with the Super Mario Brothers movie in late March, early April, even though that is just two months before the movie itself opens. That seems ridiculous. But Hollywood studios like to drop a trailer, or they could drop the Little Mermaid, Mermaid trailer whenever they wanted, and they would make a very big splash. So maybe they're just waiting for this personal situation with Halle Bailey to die down, and then they'll bring this out. Uh, I would certainly hope they don't wait till the Super Mario Brothers movie, but that's not a bad movie to be paired with because that movie's going to be big. You want to ride the tails, the fin of a big movie. That's usually how trailer releases work. For instance, John Wick 4 is releasing a trailer this Thursday, a new trailer to play with Quantum Mania. So Universal, never underestimate Universal as we know. Illumination also usually delivers. And Nintendo is super hot right now. Even I'm starting to get Nintendo fever with The Land opening up in Universal Studios Hollywood recently. Toadstool Cafe, I want to go to there. And wow, Fast X is the only trailer in the group? That seems a little suspect to me. I would think The Flash would be in there for sure. But I have a theory on that which we'll discuss in a moment. But you gotta give it up for Fast X. Again, Universal is always a shockingly strong competitor. And also, these are YouTube views, and you, YouTube is, of course, a global audience. And that Vin Diesel, he's got global appeal, at least when he's in a Fast and Furious movie. As I've said before, I think Fast X and The Little Mermaid are 2023's, this year's, best bets at Billion Dollar Club entries. Uh, as for comic book fans, it was all about James Gunn versus James Gunn, that's right. And while the official Marvel trailer edged out the official Flash trailer in terms of views, just like with HBO and HBO Max, Warner Brothers Discovery is up in here dividing up their view count with multiple official distribution channels. How stupid is that? Look at Marvel, they got one official channel. I mean, there are a few little things here and there, but everybody watches it on the Marvel channel. And they, you know, you know, again, Warner Brothers should not put it on the movie channel. They should potentially just put it on the DC channel. Although, where do they have more subscribers? I mean, it's ridiculous. Just, they're going to have to bite the bullet at some point. And uh, you can see it's already, it's again, once again, undercutting them. Because I, I believe that when you took, take all the Flash views together, 
it did very well last night. So yes, overall, I would say the Flash trailer, a debut trailer as opposed to a second trailer for Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, first look trailers always do better. DC did get a win over Marvel last night. Although, but I think to be fair also to Disney, they were put in a difficult position because they had to pull the Little Mermaid trailer. That would have, I think, definitely won the night for sure. Even, you know, it's not a comic book movie, so the Flash could still hold its head high, but Little Mermaid would have dominated last night if it had, if it had debuted. But I would say, as for The Flash, I would say the reaction was better than any of those for the Black Adam or James Gunn Suicide Squad trailers, but not, so it was better than those, but not quite as strong as I think the Batman reactions. Uh, you know, people just went nuts over uh, the Batman. Uh, but Snyderverse fans were particularly thrilled, you know, that, that, who've been very difficult for DC and continue to be difficult for DC. They were really thrilled as the film embraces the DCEU of the past few years. So, uh, you know, that's pretty interesting. It's definitely a strong start for Warner Brothers Discovery's DC, who are betting big on The Flash thanks to strong test scores. Off-screen drama, be damned. And a lot of you don't seem to care either. And if audiences actually show up in a meaningful way at the box office this time, for once with the DC movie, uh, I think... I think it could, I think the Batman, unfortunately, wasn't as strong as I would have liked it to be. I think that the Flash, the way I see it now, I think it could perform like the Batman in the 700 million range. Uh, I could see it maybe 500, 600. Right now, it doesn't look like a Black Adam level flop to me at all. But, so I would put it anywhere between 500 and 700 million at this point. I know some of you are like, billion dollars, baby. Let's see, let's see. But it's in a very competitive month in June. June, I told you summer was going to be packed this year, and June is like the most crowded month. Uh, and, you know, Flash will not be able to hold on to its premium screens. But even, even if it's able to do just between five and seven hundred million, that would definitely put DC back in play in a major way. That would be not, not under any, if it can have a good RT score, most fans liking it, and solid box office, I think that everybody would be very happy with that. But it could also further complicate things for DC on that note, because Gunn has made it clear he's not moving forward with any of the stars of this film, except potentially Ezra Miller, which would also speak to the changing, are they changing realities of cancel culture? And as I pointed out last night, if Ezra Miller can come back, Will Smith, whose actions were far less severe, should certainly be able to make a comeback as well. Uh, and if he can't, it's going to be very similar to the Andrea Riseborough Oscar situation, I feel. And that's going to be another really bad look for Hollywood. All right, so and if The Flash is a huge hit, how do you not continue with Michael Keaton, Sasha Kaye, and Ben Affleck, as Walter Hamada had planned to do? And what will, what will happen to the new actors now coming in to take over the roles of Guns, Batman, and Supergirl? Although, please note, Kaye, she might be playing Kara, but she is not playing Supergirl. That character is not Supergirl. It is a gender-bent version of the Superman from the Flashpoint storyline. And that's why her costume looks the way it does. If anything, she's Superwoman. She's not Supergirl. So it's a different character. But what did you think of last night's Super Bowl commercials and trailers? Who do you think won? And who do you think would have won if Little Mermaid had been in the mix? Trick question? It's, it's obviously Little Mermaid. All right, so anyway. And what do you think Flash needs to be considered a win for DC? And how do you feel about the Ezra Miller situation, right? All right, as for the week, I mean, it's just crazy how many, how, how quickly so many people say, I don't know. I don't know. Again, it's hard to tell with DC. There is a very loud, I think, sus we suspect small group of DC fans who are very, very, who really have a lot of sway in that world. And that's why I said, you know, maybe you shouldn't be so interfering because, you know, Walter Hamada was actually doing what you wanted. Uh, so, you know, you never know. I mean, are DC fans too involved in the business decisions at this point? I mean, that's a fascinating question, which we're going to see play out. You know, at least DC, DC always, like Arby's, it's always got the drama. Uh, but so, you know, I think, you know, this is, this is a very interesting situation. All right. So talk amongst yourselves down below in the comments. All right. So as for the weekend box office, Warner Brothers Discovery won this weekend, kind of with the lowest debut yet from the Magic Mike franchise. But don't blame Channing Tatum. He is in the middle of a comeback, a legit comeback. This also, to be fair, Magic Mike's Last Dance was supposed to go direct to HBO Max, so it was not designed for theatrical release. It's on a smaller scale. It was really made to keep Magic Mike in the public eye because they have a Magic Mike live stage show 
both in Las Vegas and London and also currently on tour in the United States. And they want you to, they want that to seem fresh and current because, you know, it's competing with the, the classic male stripper brands of what, uh, what Chippendales and what, like Thunder Down Under, right? As I like to say, the Pepsi and Coke or the Coke and Pepsi of male stripping. So what would that make Magic Mike in the, with the soda metaphor? And I would be interested to hear your thoughts on that as well. Uh, so Warner Brothers Discovery, though, was like, hey, let's put it in theaters with a very small ad spend of just about 20 million. For big blockbusters, they spend over 100 million to advertise them. So this was just, again, really about maintaining the prestige of the Magic Mike brand. Hey, it's for theaters. It has not gone to streaming, right? Just like, so you should go out and see the live show. And I wonder if Warner Brothers Discovery gets a cut of those live shows. I couldn't find them listed anywhere on the website, which I was looking at for research purposes. <laughs> I really was, but it sounds super suspicious. So anyway, uh, I did not see Warner Brothers Discovery or Warner Brothers Theatrical listed anywhere there. All right, so. The other big winner this weekend was once again, oh, so funny, was once I uh, was once again Mr. Jimmy Cameron. Now, not only is Avatar 2 not just three million away from overtaking Titanic on the all-time worldwide chart, really just three million away, and it's definitely going to be able to do that. It made seven million this weekend, and it's ninth weekend. And even though Quantumania is coming, that's what it made in a single weekend. It will definitely make three million in the next couple of days. So it's going to do it. It's going to do it. Uh, and that will, really will give Zoe Saldana top three uninterrupted. But Titanic itself was back in theaters this weekend with a 4K 3D re-release for its 25th anniversary, and it took third place. Overall, the top 10 was in better shape than it has been in a while, with every movie in the top 10 clearing a million. Low bar. Low bar. 80 for Brady and Knock at the Cabin did not hold well in their second weekends at all. Expect both to be on digital quite soon while Universal's Puss in Boots 2 and Megan continue to do very well in theaters despite having been on digital for weeks now. Puss in Boots 2 has surpassed the original Puss in Boots domestic box office and is about to pass Sing 2. Uh, I, I couldn't have happened to a better movie. I love Puss in Boots 2. It warms my heart to see people won over to it all the time. Uh, you know, as, the time, as time goes by. I, you guys constantly are tweeting me saying, I finally checked it out and you're right, it's amazing. Uh, and Megan is getting awfully close to the century mark. Uh, Jason Blum was like, please get Megan to the century mark. I don't think she's going to get there, actually. But with such a low budget, being so close is still mighty impressive. I mean, that's impressive. Uh, oh, and I think the second film, unless they royally mess it up, which I don't see happening, will definitely get to the century mark. Over on streaming, let's start with Nielsen, per usual, for the second week of January. Ginny and Georgia are still queen here, but this was, the, this was the week that the final season of The Walking Dead showed up on Netflix, and as you can see, the results were explosive. Now, speaking of zombies, I know they're not zombies, they're infected, but The Last of Us debuted this Sunday, the Sunday in this window, January 15th, the very final day here. And it didn't break in with day one viewing, which is suspicious also to me. So next weekend, we'll see where it lands on Nielsen's charts after it's had a full week. You know, the audience is growing. It is growing week to week. But the numbers are so low on Nielsen this week. How is The Last of Us not here? Now, of course, its audience is divided, as is the case with all HBO shows, between HBO and HBO Max. And Nielsen only counts HBO Max. Now, considering how so, how so many of you didn't realize that The Last of Us dropped early on HBO Max on Friday this week because of the Super Bowl, and I, 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 it didn't air on HBO until Sunday, its regular time, it makes me think a lot of you have HBO and not HBO Max. Or perhaps you sail the seven seas, right? Arr. So I'm curious, how do you watch The Last of Us? Uh, so maybe we'll find out The Last of Us is also a very pirated show, which, you know, you know, I, I think the show, it, it's getting, I really think that Five, as I said in my recent review, is where it's finally like really hit, hit its stride. And I think it's on its way maybe to becoming, except for the bleakness, uh, a major, major show. But speaking of bleak, things were so quiet in January, there are a ton of acquired shows on the main list. Bluey is on the overall list? Whoa. And not a single movie could make it onto the overall list at all. It is weird, again, that The Last of Us, even with day one viewing, considering what a breakout hit it was, couldn't break into these charts. But as Pedro Pascal said on SNL, let's put a pin in this for now. As for Netflix's own charts for just last week, Kenya Barris might have a lot of detractors, and he's certainly no Shonda Rhimes or Ryan Murphy, but he's still delivered for Netflix, with you people holding on to the number one spot and going up even a little bit with its viewership for its second weekend. 
With shows, Ginny and Georgia finally lost the top spot to new show Lockwood & Co., while Wednesday is still towards the top 10. Number three, 11 weeks out. She's the avatar of Netflix, of streaming. With Samba TV saying they made headlines today, putting out a report claiming that Wednesday is an even bigger hit than House of the Dragon. And Warner Brothers Discovery is like, leave us alone, darn it. All right, so if that's true, if that's true, I mean, Samba TV, I, I, I don't know about them. But if it is true, that would be likely due to Wednesday, of course, being for all ages, whereas House of the Dragon is obviously for mature audiences. Hollywood loves PG-13 for a reason. ka -ching! Over on, although so, uh, Bob Iger said last week, it's hard to make money into streaming. It's not, it's not as lucrative as, uh, as the old school linear distribution methods. Uh, over on iTunes, Plane is still number one with Ship now being shopped to distributors, it was announced today, with Mike Coulter and not Gerard Butler taking over the franchise. Good for Mike Coulter. He seems to have found himself a new franchise after Luke Cage. Uh, he could still come back as Luke Cage, but uh, nobody, none of us in the Scoop community have heard anything about him. It's, you know, it's all about, of course, Charlie Cox and uh, Kristen Ritter. All right, meanwhile, I Want to Dance with Somebody is do, doing about as lackluster on digital as it did in theaters, but at least it managed to stay in the top ten. As for this coming weekend, Marvel is back, baby, and hopes to prove that superhero fatigue, or is that Marvel fatigue, is just a myth. That's what Kevin Feige says. He says, pshaw, I'm not worried, but is he sweating under his ball cap? Uh, we'll see what happens with this weekend. The first test, of course, is the review. The review embargo lifts tomorrow, Tuesday, Valentine's Day, at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, and we'll see what that RT score looks like. Right now, I feel it could break in either direction. My review is all ready to go. It will be up at noon. And it doesn't have a lot of competition. Another gimme for Disney. Uh, in theaters, there's also Marlowe, based on, of course, the very famous literary character. But it's really just a highbrow standard Liam Neeson film. But it has a very strong cast. It screams streaming to me, though, and digital. I mean, I'm surprised it's even getting a theatrical release. But it is. That opens on Wednesday. And yes, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, also opens on Wednesday in very limited release. Like, not only just a handful of theaters, but it looks like, according to Fandango, just one showtime a day. Uh, although I don't believe people are beating down the door to get to Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. By the way, I heard a rumor. I was talking to a friend of mine in the industry, and they feel that the reason that Disney redesigns Mickey Mouse every decade or every couple of decades is to basically renew the copyright so that the character doesn't fall into fair use because every time there's a new version of the character, they can kind of like say, okay, now we have to protect this version. That's interesting because you'll note that Winnie the Pooh is basically the same design. He hasn't been updated in a very long time. And I think that's because, you know, Mickey Mouse is a character created by Disney Whereas, you know, Winnie the Pooh, of course, was created by A.A. A. Milne and, you know, made famous by Disney. But it's not their creation. So maybe that's kind of like where they draw the line over at the Disney Corporation. I don't, I'm not even sure if the redesign would work in terms of keeping a character out of fair use. But it's an interesting theory. And I wonder if we'll see Disney argue it in the next couple of I think Mickey Mouse is supposed to go into fair use like any, any year now. So I think that, that was an interesting theory. I wanted to share it with you. On streaming, Jada Pinkett Smith docuseries African Queens debuts Wednesday on Netflix, and the streaming service also has season three of The Upshaws, which is quite popular, on Thursday. Also on Thursday, Star Trek Picard starts its final season on Paramount+, Plus. the franchise holding up that entire streaming service. And on Friday, the final season of Carnival Row drops on Prime Video. Apple TV, also, Apple TV is a pretty exciting place right now. I love what they're doing. They have some great stuff. Uh, I'm watching Bad Sisters and Shrinking, and on Friday, I'm gonna start watching Hello Tomorrow, a sort of Black Mirror Mad Men show by way of the Jetsons. It looks cool. It looks super cool. I love that kind of stuff, too. And that's this week's Movie Math. What have you been watching? What do you plan to watch? And what do you predict will be the opening weekend for Quantumania? The last few Marvel movies have not only cleared 100 million opening weekend, but opened well above 100 million. Yet an Ant-Man movie has never done so. Place your bets, right? And come back next Sunday when we discuss the results. Share your overall thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.